I'm gonna murder you like Carol murders her husband. What do you know, Hockey Dog? Time, mother truckers! Oh, I didn't see you there. It's time for your video. Right now? Hi, I'm Christian Casey, and today I'm going to talk to you about the video game Assassin's Creed Origins. Assassin's Creed Origins is a game set in ancient Egypt, which debuted in 2017. It was made by the software company Ubisoft, and it's part of the broader Assassin's Creed story. And what makes it really interesting for our purposes is that it's set in ancient Egypt, and the creators of the game made a uh, concerted effort to be as accurate as possible in the way they depicted the world of ancient Egypt. So what we're trying to do here is decide whether Assassin's Creed Origins is a good way to learn about ancient Egypt for a new student. So the basic question is, uh, if someone plays this game, will they gain accurate information about the world of Egypt by playing it? So what I'm gonna do is review the game from an Egyptological perspective and try to answer that question. So just to get started, I'll go very briefly over the story. Assassin's Creed Origins begins in the year 59 BC. Um, at that time, Egypt is under the control of the Ptolemies, specifically um, Cleopatra VII, who is the you know Cleopatra the Great, and Ptolemy the Thirteenth, and they're vying for control over the country. And then Julius Caesar enters the scene, and of course he and Cleopatra have a relationship. And then after this, the, the Romans gain control of Egypt and it becomes a Roman province. You play as Bayek, who is a Medjai from Siwa. And he's sort of an, uh, I like to say he's the Forrest Gump of ancient Egypt. He's sort of a everyman character um, from a peripheral area who gets involved in some major historical events. He's accompanied by a Benelli's eagle named Senu um, who provides the the eagle vision, which is, uh, you know, in Assassin's Creed, when you're playing, you can identify where enemies are by sort of flying over the fortress that you're attacking, um, and Senu allows you to do that. So just a quick note, the number one criticism I have about this game is their use of Egyptian language. So at the time that this is taking place, you know, 59 BC, the Ptolemaic era, we actually have a pretty good idea of what the Egyptian language would have sounded like, but for whatever reason, they chose to sort of invent their own pronunciations of words or uh, use the standard Egyptological pronunciation. It doesn't always work out very well. So in this case, um, they chose his name as Bayek. Uh, according to the creators of the game, they chose Bayek because they didn't want to call him Bike. Um, it wasn't clear to me and when I interviewed them why Bike was the only other option, but we do know from, uh, from Coptic sources that at the time this word was pronounced something like back. Um, and then Senu is a female eagle in the game, but she's given uh, an inexplicably masculine name. And we also know that it, her name would not have been pronounced Senu, it would have been pronounced something like Snell. Um, but that's just a minor thing about language. I think the choice of a Benelli's eagle was uh, a really good one. So whenever I've talked to other Egyptologists about this game, um, the first question is why didn't they make Senu a lantern falcon. So the lantern falcon is the animal avatar of the god Horus. It's a really uh, prevalent symbol in Egyptian art. Um, so it seems a little odd to us that they wouldn't have chosen this animal, given that they needed a bird of prey. Um, but I think the Benelli's eagle is actually a good choice. So it needs to be an eagle because it has to fit with the existing lore of Assassin's Creed. Uh, it, it needs to explain the origin of eagle vision. But they chose a animal that's native to Egypt and actually does bear a striking resemblance to the lander falcon. So in this slide, you can see uh, Benelli's eagle, actual photo on the right, and then a faience uh, lander falcon from the Met. And, you know, obviously they look quite similar. Uh, Bayek's wife Aya is also involved. So spoiler alert, she was part of the uh, assassination of Julius Caesar. Um, and Together, they form a brotherhood of assassins that, you know, it's the origin of the Assassin's Creed, essentially. And their goal is to uh, protect the powerless from the abuses of the powerful. A lot of times Egyptologists will ask, um, why is this called Assassin's Creed Origins if it's set in Ptolemaic Egypt? So to us, the idea that Ptolemaic Egypt would be the origin of anything is 
is a little strange. I think it might be better to call it Assassin's Creed Origins. Uh, but it was really a carefully thought out decision. They wanted to create a world in which the old things of ancient Egypt were still present, but they wanted to have things like empty tombs and ruins that you could explore while playing the game. And for that reason, Ptolemaic Egypt is actually a really good choice. So the pyramids are still there. They're actually, they still look like the old kingdom pyramids um, because they still have the limestone casing stones on the side. Those were removed uh, during the Middle Ages. Um, so they would have looked very similar. They still would have had a gold per pyramidion on top, um, but they would have been slightly decayed. So they create little cracks in the stones that you can climb up because they're about 2000 years old at this point. And this is one of the areas where I think the game's creators did a really good job and that's architecture. So if you look at some of the settings in the game, you'll find that they closely mirror their real life locations. And you can even use your knowledge of the actual places to help you solve problems in the game. For instance, at one point you come across Joseph's Step Pyramid and you need to find a way to get into the tomb underneath the pyramid. Um, if you know the layout of Joseph's Step Pyramid Complex, you can easily find the tomb because the entrance is located um, slightly to the north, but inside the compound, away from the actual pyramid itself. And you can find it there in the game. When you go inside, you'll find uh, corridors, with walls covered in green faience tiles, just like you would find in real life. But I think even more interesting than the major sites are the ordinary houses. So scattered throughout the game world, if you explore, you'll find mud brick houses or um, you know temporary houses made of straw. And these are things that you don't really get to see in any other way. You kind of have to play this game to encounter that real life world of ancient Egypt. Even Egyptologists don't see a lot of those things because of course they haven't survived to the modern era. Um, so I think that's one of the big takeaways is getting this glimpse into ancient Egyptian daily life. They also did a great job of depicting real places. So for their inspiration, they took the watercolors of Jean-Claude Gauvin and used those to recreate a game world that matched some of the best reconstructions of ancient Egypt that we have available. So for instance, here you can see a watercolor of the city of Siwa and then the Siwa in the game world. This is the Pharos Lighthouse at Alexandria. And here's the game's version. Um, Hatshepsut's Temple at Deir el-Bahri. And again, the game's version. The tombs at Deir el-Medina. Uh, the Temple of Luxor with the Temple of Karnak in the background at Thebes. One of the places where they did decide to change things a little bit is in the height. So most of ancient Egypt would have been very flat. The cultivated area along the Nile is just flat fields surrounded by uh, mountainous deserts um, on the outside. So most of the areas inside towns and cities would have had flat ground and not much grade to them, but they actually added some things in. So if you look at the entrance to the Temple of Karnak, you'll notice that there's a series of steps leading up to the first pylon, when in real life, this area is actually perfectly flat. And they did that to create opportunities for the player to uh, climb on thing and really just just to create some variation and some interest. Um, but then there's a few things that are entirely accurate. For instance, if you enter the tomb of Tutankhamun, you will see that the walls are painted just as they are in real life. Um, the restoration stela is found inside the temple of Karnak and it actually mirrors the, the real artifact. Um, interestingly, those divots down the center of the stela were created later, um, but they retained them in the game to make sure that the object remained recognizable. Another area where they did well is in geography and landscape. So in creating the game, they wanted to capture the sense of place that you experience in ancient Egypt. And in order to do that, uh, they created a massive game world. So it's not actually to scale with Egypt. They, uh, they basically created it by placing all the cities in their proper position and then um, kind of squeezing out all the middle area. So things are much closer together, but they're actually in their proper positions and you get a sense of the different landscapes that you would find in Egypt. So of course there are sandy deserts like you would expect, but there are also oases um, teeming with wild animal life. Uh, there are stone circles in the desert, which mirrors a, uh, a real life thing, the, uh, the stone circles at Nabta Playa, which uh, are very ancient and no one has able, been able to determine their purpose. 
Um, but most of the time you, you spend the game in uh, cultivated fields or in cities. Uh, so that's Alexandria, this is Memphis, and this is Thebes. And through that, you actually get a sense of what ancient Egypt would have looked like for the people who lived there. One of the big things that conveys that is flora and fauna. So if you are to wander in the fields, you'll find fields of flax with their sky blue flowers. And uh, just as a minor point of interest, I threw in that the ancient Egyptian word for flax flower is awanimpe, which means color of sky, um, in reference to their sky blue color. You'll also find red poppies, and we now know that poppies were grown for opium production during Ptolemaic Egypt, so that's historically accurate. Um, and then if you visit any of the, the Libyan areas, you'll find olive trees and Greek farmers. You can visit markets and find uh, fruit that is largely correct. They did add mangoes to the game because they, they wanted those colors, um, even though mangoes would not have been available. In Ptolemaic Egypt, but there's also uh, dates and pomegranates and all the sorts of things that you would expect to see. Um, and then you have lots of wheat fields, which is what you should expect. So here you have a man um, harvesting unripe wheat for some reason, but you get the idea. There are wheat fields everywhere. And um, uh, barley and emmer were the staple crops of Egypt. They were the things that made it rich. They were actually its currency for much of Pharaonic history. Uh, so it's really important to see that in any realistic game. Then there are other things like uh, papyrus farms, where they would have grown papyrus and uh, cut the stalks for use in making paper, sandals, uh, boats, houses, and all sorts of things. The animals make the game really interesting. So there are lots of cats, including a specifically Egyptian cat breed called a mal. Um, the Cats and humans are the only things that you're not allowed to kill in the game without facing consequences. So I think that's kind of interesting. Cats are sacred even in the game world of Assassin's Creed. Um, but there's also, you know, uh, donkeys with their grumpy owners, uh, camel caravans in the desert, and all of those sorts of things. The thing I think is most interesting about the game and the thing that they really did well is how they handled so if you're a uh, Egyptology nerd like me, you'll be really excited to find some famous people. For instance, in Ramses II's afterlife, you meet his son, uh, Hamwas, who's a famous figure in Egyptology. He's known as the first Egyptologist because uh, even in ancient times, he traveled around visiting sites that were much older and recording them and trying to preserve them for posterity. Um, you'll even get to fight uh, Ramses II himself in the underworld in a sort of uh, upside down version of the battlefield of Kadesh. So that's fun. Uh, but even going beyond that, I think the use of ordinary people is what makes this game really special. So everyone in the game has some sort of purpose. They're all busily doing something at all times. They, they seem like they exist externally of the player, which is something that you don't often get in video games. A lot of times it sort of feels like the world is just you know, created the second you walked through the door. But Assassin's Creed Origins did a really good job of uh, creating the sense that there is a world here, there are people who are doing other things that aren't really connected to the player. Um, so it, it makes it feel much more alive. And I have just this quote from a magazine article by one of the game's creators. Um, he said, real people, real events that are much smaller than the grand stage, the Cleopatra Caesar stuff. And we asked ourselves, how can we provide these experiences, these stories to players? So in conclusion, I think the game does a very good job of depicting ancient Egypt. I think if you know nothing about ancient Egypt and you play this game, you will gain an immense amount of knowledge. Um, if you already do know something about it, you'll still have plenty of things to learn. And most importantly, you'll have the experience of visiting a world that is very much like ancient Egypt. So I always say that Assassin's Creed Origins is the closest thing we have so far to a time machine. Um, I hope you enjoy playing it.